Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. We ended our discussion with uh, the Czechoslovakian uh, film Kolya last time and uh, we have been talking about cinema from Poland and other parts of Europe. So, we continue and today I will be focusing on cinemas of Hungary, Sweden and also Greece. Now, the purpose behind this discussion is uh, to talk about the various national cinemas. We have already been talking about the various national cinemas as you might recall French New Wave cinema, the Italian Neorealism, okay, but they were major movements. Uh, how, although uh, um, earlier on we had discussed Chinese transnational cinema. So, every country has its own peculiar kind of cinema and that is what our attempt has been to discover and explore. Um, we need to realize that uh, national cinema is a problematic category, shifting political landscapes at the national level is a major factor that shape cinema, thus making national cinema as a continual process evolving with the upheavals of or upheavals that take place in various nations. So, it is not, it is a cinema like all other um, cultural contra, uh, cultural constructs is never static. It changes with every major development or political upheaval. This is uh, quite true especially in international cinema. Again, we have to take into account the domination of Hollywood as a global presence and also the way Hollywood markets and distributes its products particularly through DVDs and mass releases. In recent times, however, there has been a trend towards more hybrid kind of cinema from across the world in order to respond to the challenges posed by Hollywood. It is through these lenses we must study world cinema. Now, coming to Hungarian cinema, the first nationalization of the film industry happened in Hungary in 1919. However, after the fall of the communist government in 1920, cinema was again put under private ownership. This was the time when influential filmmakers such as Alexander Korda and Martin, uh, sorry, Michael Curtis were forced to leave Hungary. You might recall that Michael Curtis made two iconic films in Hollywood, namely um, Casablanca and Mildred Pierce. In the late 50s, a younger generation of filmmakers came into the uh, picture and they set up something called Bellas Bella Studio, which was named after the famous Hungarian filmmaker who was also an established film theorist. Bellas Bella Studio started first as a film club in 1959 and was refounded in 1961 as a film studio. It worked both inside and outside the structure of socialist state film production. In nearly five decades, it co-produced and produced more than 500 films in all genres from short features and documentary films through, through long documentaries, major feature films, experimental films and video including animations and um, contemporary documentaries. The films produced by Bellas Studio tell uh, a remarkable story engaging, engaging with social problems under communism that range from the unequal treatment of ethnic minorities in gypsies to the exploitation of average citizens good faith in communism by party functionaries in long distance runner and also the alienation and low bro taste of uh, the Hungarian citizens in New Year's Eve. Uh, though the filmmakers could not control the distribution of their own films, they did receive the economic and technological resources necessi uh, necessary to realize ambitious experimental works for a circle of intellectuals and 
interested professionals including foreign critics who in the 1960s awarded the studio a number of prizes at short film festivals and other competition. Interestingly and this is just a trivia the abbreviation of the studio was BBS and this is not to be confused with the Hollywood BBS. Now, uh, a major film of this period is Istvan Gaal's The Falcon which draws an analogy between the taming of wild birds and the way of life that requires blind obedience. Pal Gabor's Engivera deals with the repressive climate of Stalin's Hungary in the late 1940s. Istvan Zabo's Mephisto is a 1981 film and it is an exploration of the psyche of an actor living through the rise of Nazism in Germany and conforming to the new regime in any way necessary to maintain his position. Um, if you wish, you can also look at the parallels between this Hungarian Mephisto and also Bertolucci's The Conformist. Mephisto's screenplay with Zabo co-wrote is based on the 1936 bo book which is also titled Mephisto by Klaus Mann, the son of the great German writer Thomas Mann and uh, who is the brother of Erika Mann to whom the uh, characters in the movie the Grungens were uh, married before uh, Erika fled from Hitler's Germany. The title is an ironic reference to the actor's celebrated role Mephistopheles in Faust, John, um, Jonathan Gaites Faust. Mephisto delineates the course of an opportunist whose life is nothing more or less than the sum of all the roles he has played. Now coming to Swedish cinema, in 1907 the famous Svenska Bio Studio was formed in Sweden. One of the earlier significant films from Sweden was the Vagabond Galoshes based on a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale which had a scene shot on location in France and the US involving a tracking shot which was uh, quite radical by the standard of those times. An important film of the 40s was Frenzy which also launched the career of Ingmar Bergman as a screenwriter and mark the renaissance of Swedish cinema. Talking about Ingmar Bergman, uh, one of the greatest filmmakers the world has seen, he was born in 1918. His father was a pastor and one of the recurring themes in his films is an ongoing tussle with his strict religious uh, upbringing. He made his directorial debut with Crisis in 1945. From the 1950s onwards, he became the face of Swedish cinema. While the Strawberries, his 1957 film is expressionist with doses of Freudianism. At its center is a 76-year-old Professor Isaac Bogg, a distinguished medical scientist who travels from Stockholm to Lund with his uh, daughter-in-law to receive an honorary doctorate. During the car journey, the old man remembers his past, the girl he loved who married his brother in, instead and his own unfortunate and unsuccessful marriage. The film opens with a famous dream sequence. Borg arrives at a house uh, with boarded up windows in the old quarter of Stockholm. He sees a clock with no hands and an old hearse approaching. One of its wheels gets caught up on uh, the lamppost and a coffin falls out and the outstretched hand of the corpse within tries to pull Bog inside. The seventh seal is an allegory for man's confrontation with the ultimate reality of death. Bergman sets this spiritual film in a medieval uh, setting as Sweden is suffering by plague. Um, there is a knight who is on his way back home after a battle. Among the many people they, uh, the knight and his squire interact with is death itself. One of the great scenes of the film is when the knight invites death for a game of chess. So, here is a scene from the seventh scene. Bergman then went on to make a series of psychodramas in the 1960s, most of which starred Liv Ullman. 
Persona is about a young nurse, Alma, played by B.B. Anderson, who is placed in charge of a famous actress, Elizabeth, which is played by Lee Wellman. Elizabeth, uh, Alma is informed, had some sort of breakdown while performing on stage and now refuses to speak or even move, though it is somehow been determined that she is perfectly fine both physically and mentally. The doctor suggests that Alma take Elizabeth to stay at a seaside resort where the two women gradually develop a close bond of friendship even though Elizabeth still will not speak a word. Other remarkable films by Ingmar Bergman include Scenes from a Marriage, The Wilder and his later masterpiece Autumn Sonata which again stars Liv Ullman and Ingrid Bergman. As It Is In Heaven is a K. Pollock's 2004 film and a fascinating work on um, Swedish rural life, love and the power of music. Daniel Darius, the protagonist, makes his career as a young musician and soon becomes one of the most famous conductors in the world. There comes a point when um, he collapses, he overexerts himself and he collapses on a stage and has to rethink his life. He retreats to the north where he was brought up. His journey through the woods of Scandinavia is interspersed with flashbacks of his youth and also the um, untimely death of his mother. Soon he realizes that perfection is impossible as the villagers start looking to profit from his presence and his fame. He is approached by the local church choir to accept the role of a choir master which he agrees to. The choir we are told or we are shown is a microcosm of the rural, rural society and Daniel rediscovers his love for music here. The harsh reality of everyday life keeps surfacing but in the end the music triumphs. At an international competition in Austria the village choir sings in the final and astonishes the audiences. The film's appeal lies in its magnificent acting and its cinematography with trips through snow covered forests, the church twinkling with Christmas, uh, Christmas lights and the warmth of the sun on the lake. A highlight of the film was Gabriel's song which has acquired a cult following across Europe. Here is a scene um, and this is Gabriel's song. Lasse Hallström is uh, known for his outstanding Swedish film, My Life as a Dog, which is set in a small village in Sweden. Ingmar, a 12 year old boy, is dealing with his mother's death and is separated from his dog. The film was appreciated for its gentle tone and lack of sentimentality. Inspired or uh, bioed by the success of My Life as a Dog, uh, Lasse Hallström went to Hollywood and directed films such as What's Eating Gilbert Grape, The Cedar House Rules, Chocola and Casanova. Um, let's move on to talk about Greek cinema. The first Greek film appeared in 1912, but it was followed by a period of instability, preventing any attempts to form a strong film industry. From the 1950s, Michael Kakoyanis became a leading force and reached the peak of popularity with Zorba the Greek in 1964. Here is a memorable sequence from Zorba the Greek. One of the greatest filmmakers from Greece is Theo Angelopoulos, who recently died uh, in a road accident. He is a master of uh, his uh, generation. He was much influenced by uh, international masters such as Antonini, especially in his use of landscape to mirror the mood of a scene and also in his exploration of the so called dead time when nothing happens yet the camera goes on filming even after the characters have walked out of the shot. His sparse style was demonstrated in his first feature reconstruction. Shot in high contrast, black and white, it was about a Greek migrant worker who returns from Germany and is murdered by his wife and her lover. 
It was immediately clear that the director was less interested in the crime story than in the ideological and also in the individual and collective implications of the murder inquiry. Angelo Perlis then emerged on the international scene with his impressive historical triptych Days of 36, The Travelling Players and The Hunters, the most ambitious Greek films to date. These films are long contemplative studies of modern Greek histories. Talking about The Travelling Players, it is set in 1952 and focuses on a troop of actors recalling Greek political history and their own personal histories since they last visited the country in 1939. The film as is characteristic of all Angelopoulos films is uh, very long, the travelling place particularly is 4 hours long. Here Angelopoulos creates a bleak and profoundly tragic portrait of the dissolution of the national soul. He frames the characters through medium and long shots in order to create a distant camera perspective and you should also note the moving camera shots in most of his films. Here is a shot or here is a scene from the travelling place. Eternity and a day as the title suggests another great film by Angelo Paulus. Here time is a central concern, a conceit um, and uh, if this time or now you know lack of time is a major concern to celebrated writer Alexandra which is played by Bruno Granz. He has been uh, diagnosed with a terminal illness as he makes preparations prior to entering the hospital. He travels in and out of his past and in and out of fantasy seeking to make peace with a lifetime reaching its end. The fluidity of time and character in the narrative structure is a key characteristic of Angelo Paulus's work and nods at the films as I already told you by Antoninini and also Ingmar Bergman. Here is, a, here is the famous bus scene from Eternity and a Day. Ulysses Gaze is a retelling of the epic Odyssey drawing together three separate narrative strands, Greek mythology, the plight of the former Yugoslavia and the centenary of cinema. Angelo Polis made this film in 1995 and as you know cinema by then had completed its 100 years. Hollywood star Harvey Keitel stars as an emigre film director who goes on a lo uh, location hunting spree in the war ravaged Balkans in search of a surviving scrap of film by the brothers Yanakis and Milters Manakis who at the dawn of cinema celebrated everyday life in the region without regard for ethnic and religious distinctions. Here is a scene from Ulysses Gaze and uh, with this I would like to end today's lecture.